Well, good afternoon to all of you. It's always good to be in a commonwealth somewhere. And I, I started in one, and I've ended up in one. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about what Right on Crime is and what we do and why I think it's relevant to you all. Uh, right on Crime is one of those double entendres. And even though I was an engineer, I know what that means. Uh, it means that the words mean two different things. And the first is that we're a group of conservatives. Uh, no, no office holders, you don't qualify uh, if you're an office holder. You've got to have standards, right? And, uh, and that's from a former office holder. And, uh, but we do have a lot of prosecutors, former attorneys general like myself. Ed Meese is a signatory to the Right on Crime up, uh, entire platform. Uh, we have uh, people like Newt Gingrich and others across the conservative world of policy. Um, but a lot of prosecutors, a lot of attorneys general, who really want to see justice put into criminal justice. Uh, we are all pro-public safety. That is not something we're willing to sacrifice, which is a difference between how those of us on the right talk about criminal justice reform and how those on the left talk about it. We want justice, not just punishment. And we're frugal, uh, something that is frankly lacking in government today. The second meaning is being right. We're data-driven. We use evidence-based uh, policy approaches. We gather the data from the implementation of these types of programs, and we spread them across the country, and we argue that this should be done at the federal level as well. Now, I work a lot as an attorney on privacy issues also, Fourth Amendment issues. And uh, I find that one of my allies in that is, shockingly enough, the ACLU. Um, when privacy actually means, well, privacy, uh, they can get closer to being right. But when you look at criminal justice reform, they're a good example of how the left approaches it versus us. They have a goal in Virginia. It's to reduce the prison population by 25%. Well, on what basis? Or you just, we can open the doors and let a quarter of them out. And they would say, hey, that's great. Actually, what they would really say is, that's a good start. That is not how conservatives approach criminal justice. And it's part of the rationale for why we have right on crime. If criminal justice reform is really going to ha happen, it has to start from the right. It can't start from the left. Right on Crime is a project of the Texas Public Policy Foundation, notorious uh, soft on crime state, uh, uh, very good for branding. And, and they began, uh, a lot of the criminal justice reforms, this current wave of them, in Texas. Thought of as such a hang em high, tough on crime state, and it is. But there are ways to do this that save money and do a better job of getting justice back in criminal justice. And, and the political reality is this has to come from the right, not the left. Imagine for a moment you're on the floor of the state house. You're a state senator or a member of the, of the house, and someone gets up and, and is holding up their bill. And they say, this is, a, this is a great criminal justice reform bill. This is wonderful. We have lots of evidence. It works very well, and, and actually it'll keep more people out of prison and do a better job. And they've done this in California and they think it works great. So I am in another chair on the floor as a conservative state senator and this is what I hear. Dude, I've got this totally awesome bill. It'll get lots of good guys out. And it works totally boss. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to vote for that. I'm going to vote for that. It does matter. It's a political reality. We all know it. Some of what you're talking about this weekend is message. And you can be right and lose. Heck, I did in the run for governor in Virginia. <laughs> to prove my point the hard way. Uh, but you've got to be able to sell it. And first thing about selling well is being right, is having that data to back up what you're saying. And this, while this represents an opportunity of co for cooperation across the spectrum,
The motives that bring us to the table are different than the left. Honestly, I, I think they just are, in some respects, not as concerned about public safety. Can I put that any more gently? And they're more interested in just turning folks out. We're looking for that balance. And 20 years ago, I was one of the people who supported tough on crime measures in Virginia, three strikes and you're out, some other things like that. We got rid of parole in Virginia. And crime statistics went down. But if you look at states that didn't do what we did, guess what? Crime statistics went down. And it makes the conversation pretty tough in Virginia. Because they point at Virginia and say, hey, crime went down. Why should we, why should we step back from any of this? <laughs> well, right over there in a state much like ours, they didn't do this and crime also went down. And it can be a little tough. Some of the toughest people, toughest opponents, are my fellow Republicans. I call them the Fry the Litterbug Caucus. You probably know what I'm talking about. And I'm sure there, there are plenty of them here. You can't be tough enough on crime, right? There are a lot of people who think that way, but I'm not one of them. One of the things that we find on the right that we don't find on the left is uh, a more, uh, well, more people who go to church. I'll put it that way. I believe no one's beyond redemption. That doesn't mean they don't deserve punishment for doing wrong. But when you talk about literally or figuratively throwing away the key, are you abandoning perhaps more important beliefs in your life? I think this is an, an appropriate way for us not so much to impose our faith. We don't want to do that. We don't want to do that in any area. But it's certainly consistent with mine. It's a motivating aspect of what we do at Right on Crime. And we recognize that 95% of the people in our prisons and jails are coming back out. They're coming back out. So we can all ignore that, or we can make the criminal justice system be what it was supposed to be, and that is an opportunity for rehabilitation, for correction, and for improvement of someone that's coming back to live with us as a fellow citizen. And by the way, if you can help them do that successfully, guess where they're less likely to end up? Back in that prison. This is one of those areas here in Pennsylvania, you've got a really a spectacular head of your Department of Corrections, John Wetzel. He began some of these reforms under Governor Corbett, and as I understand it, is the only agency head that was kept on with the change of administration because he's done such a spectacular job, and a job conservatives can be proud of. Again, this is one of those issues that can unite people who are on different sides of the aisle, different ends of the spectrum, uh, but who are willing to take a step back and try to achieve some common goals. And of course, when it comes from the right, we actually have credibility on public safety that the left will never have. My California example, dude. Uh, it's very real. I mean, there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. Now, right on crime brings more to the table. We bring data. We bring evidence. I mentioned I was an engineer. I'm a left-brained person. I like to see the numbers. There are things that as a state policymaker, I want to lead on. And there are things, you know, I'd rather follow. I'd rather someone else prove that this can work. And isn't that one of the beauties of the laboratory of democracy that states are supposed to serve as? We should take advantage of it. And at Right on Crime, we do. And if you have legislative leaders in Pennsylvania willing to advance some of these, we'll bring national help and we'll help put the data together to demonstrate the viability of a variety of different policies. And we'll bring witnesses in and we'll help build coalitions. We won't just say, go get them, add a boy, slap them on the back, and turn them loose. A lot of groups do do that. 
We really want you to do this. Oh, you'll do it? Great. Let us know how it goes. Hey, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Well, we don't operate that way. In some of the areas we focus on, one is overcriminalization. Uh, this is worse at the federal level than it is at the state level, but we had, um, we recently did a seminar on this at CPAC, actually, and found that in Texas, there are 11 ways you can commit a felony related to oysters. <laughs> you know, and I don't think we included, like, hitting someone with one, which is the one that would be most obvious to me. You want to protect against public safety. You know, we're, we're expected to know the laws, right? Well, the federal government literally cannot answer the question, how many federal criminal laws are there? The, the Congressional Research Service was put to the task of doing just that. Their answer to the chairman of the Judiciary Committee was, we literally don't have enough staff to figure out the answer to that question. A big part of the reason why is because these agencies create new crimes that, out of a regulatory process. It's a huge problem unto itself. <clears throat> for liberty, for justice, for the massive growth of government and its power. So that's what that's about. In 1790, <clears throat> one, of, one of the things I doing as a lawyer is suing the NSA and the president for gathering all your metadata from your cell phone. It's very motivating work. And, um, uh, and as part of the research for this, I found that in 1790, they did know how many federal crimes there were. There were about 20. There were about 20. Um, and that was with not too many people to enforce them. We've come a long way so to speak. Another area we focus on is juvenile justice. This is an area of particular passion of mine, of mine back, dating back to the 90s. If you can divert a kid from future criminal behavior, you're saving yourself a lot of money, and you're letting a citizen on a wayward path get on a path that's going to create a better life, a happier life for them and their family and their community. It has long-term benefits. Um, one example of this, is non-residential punishment or treatment, you can call it what you'd like, versus residential treatment, which are essentially juvenile detention centers. Uh, that's what we would call them in Virginia. Um, and the cost benefits of one versus the other, coupled with examples where they actually achieve better outcomes. This one may not be too illogical to you. Incarceration versus alternatives, for drug use, not distribution, but use. One way that some of us look at this is if you take a particular defendant, they've committed a crime, ask yourself these questions. Are you afraid of them or angry with them? And if you're afraid of them, then they need to be in a prison. If you're angry with them, Perhaps not. And let me put it in your wallet, using Virginia numbers. Are you ready to pay $30,000 a year to put defendant X in prison for stealing, pick a number, $1,500? You ready? Are you prepared to do that? Now, most of them don't go to prison for that long if they haven't done it before. So I don't want to sound naive up here. <clears throat> I do that afterwards. <laughs> Nonetheless, that cost-benefit analysis is rarely weighed, I can tell you as a former legislator. What happens is people come in, a legislator comes in, because somebody got under-penalized in their mind in their district and somebody complained to them. So they come in with a bill to put a mandatory minimum penalty on that offense. My personal favorite was uh, chicken fighting that you bet on. And this is, happens sometimes with illegal immigrant communities, cockfighting, uh, other things. And so I stood up and asked, let me get this straight, reading the bill. Uh, it's a felony if I go home and punch out my wife, right? I mean, a misdemeanor, sorry. 
even for your wife. So same for everybody. But, and, the, and the senator said, well, yeah. And they said, and if I were to punch out a cop, that's a misdemeanor too, right? And he's looking at the bill because he can kind of tell where I'm going. Well, uh, yeah. He said, but if my eight-year-old drops two hamsters in a box and bets a quarter on which one's going to beat the other one up, that's a felony? Uh, yeah. Okay, now you're all laughing. That bill went out 38 to 2. Thank goodness for the House of Delegates. They killed it. <laughs> and the, uh, the Humane Society took out full-page ads against me in my next election. So the chicken fighting bill. So at our victory party, and I won by 101 votes that year, we had nothing but chicken fingers. It was the only, <laughs> it was, it was the only thing you could eat. It was the only thing you could eat. And because there was a recount, we had two victory parties. And guess what you could have at the second one? Chicken fingers. And we invited the, the Humane Society. They didn't want to come. I don't understand. Um, other areas like prison performance and various rehabilitative programs compared to the recidivism rates and the cost of the two options, doing it and not doing it, probation versus incarceration and comparing outcomes and cost, these are areas that we work in, we have data in, are happy to help others advance, and they're conservative. They're frugal, smaller government, less exercise of power, without sacrificing public safety. Without sacrificing public safety. This is growing in popularity. Two of the three announced presidential candidates so far, Cruz and Paul, have spoken to these sorts of subjects rather forthrightly. I think you're gonna see more candidates on the right doing this. Um, this is smart, it reduces the power of government, and it's a coalition building opportunity. And if you really believe in attracting people with ideas and growing your team, this is one way to do it. But what we need is champions. This is a leadership conference, we need leaders who are willing to step forward, who are willing to take the time to learn these subjects to convince their colleagues in legislatures across the country, critically in Pennsylvania or federally, um, that these are good ideas, that they're willing to study the policy details to fit them to your particular state. Every state is different, has different traditions. Uh, it definitely is not one size fits all how criminal justice is received and implemented. And we're looking for people of credibility with their colleagues who are principled, conservatives and known to be. Leaders willing to combine all these factors are people who come to write on crime, and we're happy to receive them, who we can help implement their plan for their state legislatively. So as you all think about some frontiers to approach, and some of which is being done in Pennsylvania already, and as you expand your horizons on those things, I hope you'll keep right on crime and some of your fellow conservatives across the country in mind. If we can help, we want to do it. God bless all of you. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Have a great day.